It is my greatest pleasure to introduce Elena Mandiu, who is a Global Mercury Scholar uh, at the University of Warwick and a visiting scholar at the University of California, Berkeley. Um, she holds a PhD in Gender Studies from the University of Cyprus and a BA and MA in Psychology and Social Psychology from Hampton University in Athens. Her research interests include queer theory, decolonial theory, psychoanalysis, and prison studies. Elena has worked as an educator at the Nicosia Central Prison in Cyprus for five years and as a psychiatric patient in social care homes for about a decade. She's now also actively involved in teaching at St. Quentin Prison in California. Her talk today is titled Queer Pleasure, Resistance and Pain and Ex Prisoners Narratives. So please join me in welcoming Elena to our campus. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hi, all. Uh, thank you very much uh, for this um, invitation. Um, it's it's an honor for me to talk in this department. There are so many people that uh, I'm, I'm reading their work and I'm inspired from their work. Uh, Davis, Dent, your work, Parat, like De Loretis, like so, so many people. And I think it's like truly inspiring for me uh, to be here and to share with you uh, my work. Um, I, will, I will start with um, a video uh, as an introduction, and then I will jump into the presentation. Many to myself. Four, Man, criminals together, and what you get? Concentrated criminality. Crime in the midst of punishment. I agree, sir. What we need a larger prison, more. Sorry, I'm just going to try figuring out. Uh, it's okay. It's, 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 Concern any longer with outmoded penological theories. Soon we may be needing all our prison space for political offenders. Common criminals like these are best dealt with on a purely curative basis. Kill the criminal reflex, at all. Full implementation in a year's time. Punishment means nothing to them, you can see that. They enjoy their so called punishment. You're absolutely right, sir. Who said that? I did, sir.
What crime did you commit? The accidental killing of a person, sir. He brutally murdered a woman, sir, in furtherance of theft. Fourteen years, sir! Excellent. He's enterprising, aggressive, outgoing, young, bold, vicious. He'll do. Well, fine. Uh, we could still look at Seablock. No, 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 that's enough. He's perfect. I want his record sent to me. This vicious young hoodlum will be transformed out of all recognition. Thank you very much for this chance, sir. Let's hope you make the most of it, my boy. Shall we go to my office? Thank you. Go back to... Okay, so... That was a short introduction um, to my talk today with the name Queer Pleasure, Resistance and Pain in Ex-Prisoners Narratives. In, in, and that's my way to unpack that short conversation between the governor and Alex, who said they enjoy their so-called punishment, and which is, of course, much more complicated um, than that. So, um, Here is the outline of the presentation. Um, you can see I will talk a little bit about my positionality as a researcher, as someone who is coming from the South. Um, I will talk about that later, but Noom mentioned that already. I will go through the theoretical foundations of this work, um, the empirical data um, and some conclusions. Um, and of course, the, the main, um, the main question of this ongoing work is if the experience of prison can contain effects and moments of pleasure, and if yes, what are the implications of this paradox uh, for understanding the pain of imprisonment and prison punishment? And furthermore, a question that arises, if there is an ethical way to talk uh, and write about pleasure in conditions of violence and suffering. Um, in that line of thought, I argue that pain has a singular and one dimension, dimensional meaning in prison scholarship, and that pain and pleasure in prison settings uh, has been understood so far in a binary uh, formation. Uh, I'm suggesting a more queer reading, uh, which considers pleasure and pain in a spectrum, and in relation to power, punishment, resistance, failure, and sexuality. Uh, it's important also to underline that I'm using the term queer as analytical in an analytical way, uh, as, as, a as a methodological tool, and not as a way to talk about LGBTQ prisoners or LGBTQ experiences of discriminations um, in prison settings. I know that queer criminology, many people in queer criminology, they are doing that, that work, but I'm, I'm trying to push a little bit um, to a different direction. Um, one of my main priorities in presenting and discussing about pleasure in prison settings is neither to reduce the harm of imprisonment, nor to argue that prison mechanisms are becoming softer. Um, my argument is not denouncing pain uh, or romanticizing the prison experience, but argues that if the purpose of prison punishment is to inflict pain, pain, I will unpack that a little bit later, then any pleasurable experiences create lines of escape. In other words, pleasure is possible in, in prison settings, not despite the pain, but because of the pain. Um, now, a few words about my positionality. I studied psychology and social psychology um, and I, the urgency to engage with this subject came after my exposure as an educator in Nicosia Central Prison for a period of five years. I am from Cyprus, and that means that this work has been produced in the south of Europe. And it is marginal geographically, politically, and socially to the mainstream uh, research on penal institutions of big European countries, um, the USA and the UK. Mm -hmm. Um, the location of my study plays an important role 
on the contract on the construction of my argument um, as and the, the, the choice to engage uh, with notions of no futurity and failure. Um, as Preciado said about the South, South is not a place, but rather the effect on relationships between power, knowledge, and space. The South is always represented as lacking sovereignty, lacking knowledge and wealth. So the theoretical foundations of this work, um, I will present here and analyze three main theoretical pillars of this study. Um, there are more, but I'm, I'm choosing three that I think are, are the most important. Uh, first is from Foucault and his work, The History of Sexuality, as much as his personal interest on the concept of pleasure. Uh, second is from Halperstam and their work, The Queer Art of Failure. And from Mendelman and his work about the refusal of futurity and his commitment in politicizing the death drive. Starting from Foucault, I am drawing on his concept about pleasure and resistance from the history of sexuality and other words, but not from his work about prisons. And in that way, I'm trying to apply his later thought on power, pleasure, and, and resistance to his earlier work on discipline and punish and to problematize with that movement, the way that prison scholars are writing about disciplinary power and punishment. A reading from the history of sexuality can give rise to the idea of pleasure and resistance and power. The pleasure that comes of exercising a power that questions, monitor, watches, spies, brings to light, and on the other hand, the pleasure that kindles at having to evade this power, flee from it, fool it. The power that let itself be invaded by the pleasure it is pursuing, an opposite, power asserting itself in the pleasure of showing off, scandalizing, or, or resisting. In one of his interviews, uh, Foucault said, different pleasures, do not imply orientation at all, require no theory of subjectivity or identity formation. Pleasure, it can be intensified, increased, it quality is modified. So to summarize, a definition from pleasure based on Foucault is that pleasure is a productive force. Um, pleasure is fluid. Pleasure, pleasure is not always related with sexuality. Um, that definition of pleasure from Foucault is moving away from linear and normative understanding of pleasure um, that we usually read in more psychology, in more mainstream philosophy, in which pleasure is good and pain is, ba and is bad. Um, so from that idea that pleasure is fluid, uh, I'm moving to Halperstam and their work about the queer out of failure. Um, that work is important because it's, an, it's a call for an embracing of failure, uh, not as a step before success, um, but as a resistance to the logic of success, positivity, and futurity. That theorization of, of pleasure opens other modes of being uh, for queers, and I think it's a concept applicable in prison settings because it redefines what failures, failure and success is without understanding them in a binary. According to Kalperstam, in failure, you can access other forms of being in relation to others. Now, if we consider failure not only as the opposite of success and normality, but also as a philosophy of life out of, of sync, a redefinition of failure in prison settings can, can allow us to see how prisoners may approach their condition through a queer, theory, through a queer lens, through queer lens, um, like the queer out of failure. Um, now, from, from that idea of failure, um, I want to take you to uh, Endelman, and um, the concept of the death drive. 
Now, the concept of the death drive is very controversial and paradoxical concept um, developed by Freud, um, later from Lagan, and in a way, very briefly, expl explains the tendency of people to return to what is a pleasant um, or, or dramatic, or the tendency for actions that damage us. Um, now, the, 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 what is important with the death drive is that it uh, takes into account gaining pleasure from that process of self-destructiveness. Endelman uh, shifted that, that idea of the, self of, the, um, of the death drive from a classic psychoanalytic idea um, and managed to, to activate a political understanding of the death drive and allows that, that activation, that shift, uh, for, allows us to, to interpret the, the, the subject in non-pathologizing ways. Endelman states that the heteronormative investment in reproduction and the figure of the child, it's an investment in the future and it's adults with queer lives and politics. Endelman calls us to reject this futurism and refuse to engage with it. And I argue that this embrace of negativity shares common ground with some prisoners rejection of reformation development and progress. In other words, a rejection for an investment in the future. Now, to summarize before uh, continuing to more empirical scholarship, Foucault suggests that power, pleasure, and resistance, they are connected, that pleasure is fluid, can be modified, can change. Um, um, Halperstman, Halperstman suggests that failure, like through failure, we, we can access other modes of being. And then Endelman suggests the death drive as a way for understanding a rejection for an investment in the future. I'm moving now from that um, theoretical background to prison studies, um, shifting a little bit, um, to examine current and past conceptualization of pain, uh, pleasure, and resistance. Now, the most important, the most influential text about pains in imprisonment is from Sykes. Um, his idea about the five pains of imprisonment can be revised under the thought that pleasure and pain are not a binary and that both pain and pleasure exist in a spectrum and sometimes can coexist. I think beyond Sykes, it's maybe important uh, to examine a text which is more theoretical and offers in a way the pillars in which the politics of punishment was based back in the 50s. Um, it's from Hart. And according to Hart, there are five elements which define punishment. One of them is the following. It must involve pain or other consequences normally considered unpleasant. More recently, in 2018, Fassin, in his work, The Will to Punish, analyzed the five elements of Hart's definition and concluded that the infliction of pain remains the core of his definition. Through a genealogical and anthropological inquiry, Fassin concluded that punishment aims to inflict suffering has its root in Christianity. My argument in this presentation does not oppose Fassin's conclusion, but tries to make it less linear, less predictive. So the purpose of punishment is to inflict pain. And then after, what it comes after that. Um, now, looking at the prison research more specifically, um, Prison scholarship highlights the paradox of pleasure in relation to food and drugs. Um, that research um, underlines the resistance in many ways, in many different ways, but avoids, because we, we, we need also to avoid a kind of romanticization of the prison experience, avoid the conceptualization of pleasure. Now, the context. Um, this presentation draws data from two sources, a broader study of ex-prisoners in Cyprus 
where I focus on their experiences in prison through the lens of queer theory and my hands-on experience as an educator in prison settings uh, for a period of five years. Um, Cyprus is a small country of around 1 million inhabitants. Uh, was a British colony uh, until uh, 1960. There are two main communities at the moment, the Greek Cypriot and the Turkish Cypriot community. Um, the northern part of the island has been under Turkish um, occupation since 1974, and the Republic of Cyprus has remained divided since then. Um, there is one central building um, in the uh, Greek Cypriot part. Uh, it accommodates around 700 prisoners, and it's one accommodation fits all. That means that men, women, and juveniles, all of them, they are in the same building. And it's a British colonial building built in 90, 1986. Now, the method of analysis, um, I'm, I'm using the analytical way of plugging in theory to data from Jackson and Matzei. Um, thinking with theory, as is the, is the name of their book, borrowed the concept of plugging in from Deleuze and Guadari um, to refer to a constant negotiation between concepts and data, giving meaning not to the application of a holistic theory based on data, but to the connection of areas of theory with, with data. So in that way, for example, I'm using the concept of the death drive through um, the plugging in, through the, the thinking with theory um, analysis. And I'm not using the, the Freud's uh, whole theory in order to analyze my data. Um, in the same way, I'm using here from um, uh, Foucault, the concept of the death drive, but I'm not apply, applied a kind of holistic theoretical um, lens to my data. Um, in that way, I'm activating more complicated and even paradoxical uh, readings of the, of the, of the data. Um, for example, in my research, psychiatric medication can, be, can, can appear as a means for repression, uh, while the same time appears as a passive pleasure. So I'm kind to, through that plugging in, to activate more paradoxical um, readings of the data and not to follow a kind of one way of analyzing um, the narratives. In this um, research, um, I did 21 interviews um, and um, the, um, the outcome, the analysis uh, is grouped in three themes, pleasure and pain, pleasure and resistance and pleasure and sexuality. Starting from the first one, pleasure and pain. The most direct way to understand how pleasure and pain are related in prison is when we are investigating practices of tattoo, piercing, like in, in a spectrum, and then we can end up to self-harming. Um, getting tattoo and piercing secretly is common among men and women in prison. For example, one of, of the participants said about another prisoner. The day that Mihaly's sentence was announced, he decided to do a piercing on his testicle. You can hear, imagine the lack of equipment and also the pain that the above uh, entails. These practices are pleasurable and painful and they are blurring the lines between what is painful and what is pleasurable in, in, in prison settings. Some discourses and practices have been even more uh, radical and complex to read. For example, Calliope, uh, who was drugged addict and have been in prison many times, uh, said, I made another suicide attempt consciously for a funny reason. I was in solitary confinement and they wouldn't let me go out to smoke a cigarette. And I thought of cutting my hand so they would let me go out and take me to the doctor and then I would smoke a cigarette. In another instance, she said, I was cutting my hands and causing pain to calm down the high levels of tension that I was feeling. 
ones of, of Favanza's participants um, said something very, very similar. Um, when I cut myself, I get such a high feeling. Um, similarly, in, in Chamberlain's research, um, Chamberlain did research in women prisoners in the UK, one of the participants said, I could find as much blood as I could get out. I will try to suck it all out of me. It was like self-punishment, a release. Chamberlain suggests in her study that prisoners may see self-harming as a way to channel psychic pain into physical pain. Hey, Eric. Um, wow. <laughs> and what, what weird shit. Uh, okay. You're okay, great. Um, what I'm adding to that idea um, is that there is an element of, of pleasure when a prisoner is reclaiming back control over their bodies. So I'm suggesting that there is a transformation of the passive experience of imprisonment uh, into the active embodied experience of self-harming, um, where um, the prisoner is transformed into an active one through um, those practices, through piercing, cutting, burning, sucking blood, etc. And there are, these are active ways of suffering, uh, which entail, or in my, in my opinion, in my argument, bring some, some form of satisfaction or pleasure. Now, I'm going to the second category, uh, which is pleasure and resistance. Um, this section is an invitation to rethink pleasure, not in a cause and effect relationship um, to resistance, but as an embodied performative act, which related to strategies of resistance from, those, from the perspective of those who are considered failures or losers. Um, in Cyprus in 2013-2014, multiple suicides took place, and in one of those suicides, prisoners organized rebellions. One of my prisoner, or one of my participants, uh, Phileas, um, who did time in five different European countries, um, said, those days and nights after the death of Elias, we were beaten by the guards and we were starving. But the process of talking collectively, taking decisions and resisting was very exciting. Here, I want also to share with you um, a clip, a very short clip from a documentary with the name Attica. I, 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 I'm sure that many of you know that already. Uh, it's about a rebellion that took place in Attica prison in 1971. 43 people died in this riot, and it is considered critical in the history of prison rights in the US. You know, because basically we realized, you know, that all we had was, was each other. You know? So we clung to each other, spite of all our different ideologies, and there were a thousand ideologies out there. You know, they would get out of the common good. And it was just lost, all of us together. You understand, all of us eating together, you know, like having to suffer together. It was four days without payment. You had to smell each other, four days of going hungry, sharing what you had amongst each other. It was really groovy, right? You know, groovy in the sense that you know what it is to have unity. And then it was really a united thing. They, it was a thing where, you know, where we're going to do this, you know. It was it was nice. We, I, we might have a disagreement on it. But as to the thing as a whole, we're all together. Then. So that's that's the small, that's the short scene. Um, this scene, uh, this short scene reveals how prisoners bond through resisting. And it shows that an essential element of this bonding was a shared sense of pain and suffering and poses a question, 
in, in which ways pleasure and resistance are connected is if pleasure is a byproduct of resistance or the other way around. Now, collective resistance could bring a kind of excitement, um, but also according to another inmate, Robin, the individual fight was important. Robin said, um, I can say that I spent my time in there as a king. Despite the whole conflict in there, I like it. If I didn't, I wouldn't have survived. I mean, so basically you were receiving satisfaction from this conflict with the authorities? Robin, very much. Now, Robin um, emphasized that the, the, that the idea that to fight against power offers a kind of satisfaction, um, that pleasure, gives a vitality to Robin. Uh, however, this is not a romanticization of his experience since Robin recognized that the, that the prisoner is usually the one to lose in his own words, words. I did not bend, but I lost many times in this battle. And I think what is, what is important here is that almost all prisoners admitted that the prohibition of certain objects had the opposite effect that was intended. As Robin said, anything that is banned in prison takes place there. For example, drugs. If I want to use drugs, I will do it in any circumstances. And I think this is happening in prisons outside of Cyprus as well. Um, I'm moving now to the last category, which is pleasure and sexuality, um, the third point of analysis. Um, the relation of pleasure and sexuality in prison sentence is also, is also complicated. Um, I want to share here that one of my hesitations when I was writing that part was to avoid making any connections of sexuality in prison, in prisons with s and practices, and to be able to distinguish pain and pleasure um, with like consensual erotic practices. Um, so my main focus here, I, I, I'm, I'm following Foucault here, and uh, I'm trying to distinguish oppressive structures of, of domination with consensual erotic practices. And of course, it's really hard. I have one of the quotes that I have is, we can see that it's, it's hard. Anyway, a single, um, a very simple way to understand pleasure in prison settings is autoeroticism. It's a direct way to understand um, sexuality and pleasure in institutions. And like from working in psychiatric institutions too, Masturbation in, in those places is almost always a rule infraction. Uh, one of the participants said, I was collecting pictures from the Cyprus mail, from the sex art section of the newspaper, and I made them a book with materials from our book binding class. One night a prisoner asked to borrow the notebook. They, the guards, shown the cameras that I gave him something and that he took it to his room. We went to sleep and at two o'clock in the morning, officers went to his cell, searched it out, found the notebook and punished him for four days. So from that idea of autoeroticism as a way to understand pleasure in prison settings, um, I want to move now to the narrative of a trans woman, Julia. Um, her narrative also reveals the complexities and ambiguities in discussing pleasure in prison settings. I want to underline that by naming Julia a trans woman, I did not want to reinforce the notion that transgender women or prisoners are not women, but rather to reinforce the complexity of her experience. Um, Julia had a difficult time in prison. Um, she, stayed in solid, she stayed in solitary confinement for 15 days due to the confusion on her body caused, um, a body with breasts and a penis. Julia's narrative 
it, it was really hard to convince her to participate in my research. I went many times to, to, to meet her. She was canceling our meeting. So I'm really happy that I managed at the end to have uh, her, her, her narration. Um, so Julia's narrative focused on the painful systemic discrimination she faced in prison. However, she also talked with pleasure about how she used her body to perplex the authorities and to refuse victimization. I insisted that they bring me my kiki mini skirt so I could wear it with full on makeup and curled hair. And I wanted the prison guard to watch me and get horny. And if I felt like it, then I will do it with him. If this is what you want, this is what you will have. As Terry noted uh, in her work about deviant subjectivity, deviant subjectivity is itself evidence of our power, not victimhood. Victimhood. This suggestion allows us to understand Julia's narrative as a temporal shift from victimization to power and empowerment. A queer reading of that narrative suggests that while Julia experienced pain, failure, and victimization in prison, a temporal effect of pleasure and resistance was possible through her body. Now, conclusions. Um, like the other way down, or, okay. Um, the narrative of experiences reveal that they are likely to speak of pleasure in conditions of pain and punishment. I find that the queer narratives of pleasure in prison reveal several paradoxes. Uh, first is the paradox of good memories, um, falling in love, intimacy, uh, the bonding, um, uh, despite and along with the pain and violence of prison. The second paradox is the transformation of pain into pleasure. Um, the bodily pleasure pain nexus offers some kind of satisfaction to prisoners. And the third paradox is related to the urge to resist through pleasure or the urge to gain pleasure through resisting. Testimonies here suggest that the resisting in prison could be a source of spontaneous pleasure uh, as prisoners resist the logic of futurity and redefining failure. Now, it is challenging to understand whether is the punishment and pain, the purpose of punishment that generate the necessity to resist and through the process of resisting create pleasure or the stress, the need to avoid the stress and discomfort of punishment and pain that transform the desire for resistance into a desire for pleasure. As a consequence, in such condition, gaining pleasure may acquire an urgency for the psyche and polity, bodily formations of the subject. And that urgency could direct the subject in various to various directions, to resist, to mock, to sexualize, to be submissive, to develop a coping mechanism, or to self-destruct. Um, now, the contribution, contributions of this work, I'm calling for a less linear, less static understanding of prison experience. Uh, I aim to contribute to a deconstruction of the binary approach in relation to pain and, and pleasure in prison settings. Um, I'm trying to offer a different frame of understanding pl power, pleasure, and resistance in general outside of prison too. We can discuss about that if you want later. And I'm suggesting a way of doing research which embraces paradoxes and ambiguities in the production of knowledge. Thank you. Yeah, yeah.
Da kennen wir ja, wenn man möglich das. Thank you for your talk. Uh, I have uh, several basic uh, empirical questions about the of course. Um, but first, I, I'm still not quite clear why you title your talk as queer. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's not an adjective or it's a noun. And um, also, uh, you did a quick and brief introduction of Cyprus. Um, and I, you're from Cyprus. I'm from Taiwan, actually. So uh, about two decades ago, Perry Nissen wrote a piece of uh, analysis to compare these two islands. Mm -hmm. And they are very similar <laughs> in the sense of that, you know, it's, it's two sides of Greek and Turkish side, yeah, 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 and yeah, Taiwanese yeah. and Chinese side. Yeah, yeah. They, they, they thought that they had complete un, irreconcilable differences, political differences, right, to determine which direction the island should go. Yeah. And uh, two decades ago, you know, uh, Anderson concludes that Taiwan was in stasis. They are not going anywhere because neither side could compromise, right? Um, I have to say, you know, 20 years later, Taiwan's still the same. They actually institutionalized the stasis. I wonder, um, uh, uh, in your analysis, um, are these prisoners, Greek or Turkish, mm -hmm. is a prison in which side? Does this kind of political difference affect that? Are they political prisoners or criminal prisoners? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Does that affect this kind of uh, your analysis? Yeah, 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 that's great. Thank you, thank you so much. Oh, it's amazing that you did that. I totally agree that there are many different, like, similarities. And we, we are coining that solution now in Cyprus. Oh, okay. I mean, we don't have a solution. Yeah, that's, that's uh, like, um, um, my research, uh, um, have been like uh, took place in the in the Greek part. I think I talked about it at some point. Okay. Um, and of course, it's mostly criminal prisoners, okay. uh, not political prisoners. Like in the same sense, I, I don't. I don't. I think it's many years that we had political prisoners in Cyprus. Um, of course, uh, we 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 have some prisoners from the Greek Cypriot part, and it's like it's a little bit complicated. Um, the situation. I mean, it's recently some Greek Cypriot killed a Turkish Cypriot prisoner. Uh, that was like a very like violent um, uh, incident. Yeah, so it's much more complicated, definitely, from what I'm presenting here. Um, and in relation to queer, like what, why queer? Um, Queer as a way to think out of normative ways of thinking, out of nor normative ways of, of theorizing. Because if, if I was starting with a kind of mainstream uh, idea about pleasure, I couldn't have ended up with this um, analysis. Like pleasure, resistance, sexuality, those things are so important in queer theory, but then Pleasure in psychology is so many, is so it's the, it's the achievement of the good feeling. It's like a sense of you know of, of of nirvana in which you are really really good. You achieve that position. It's a kind of Aristotelian, I would say, idea about pleasure, in which pleasure is not so complicated. So I would I, my purpose is to open the complexity and. Psychology, criminology does not offer any tools to open that complexity. I think that queer theory is offering me that, that tool to talk about failure, for example, because the question is how can someone can like feel pleasure in that terrible conditions? So the idea of failure as not a binary can also help us to understand that. Thank you. Can I follow up very quickly? Go ahead. Yeah. So, so the, the use queer to refer to the methodology, not sexuality. And um, um, uh, uh, methodologically speaking, I am actually quite, I'm, I'm less interested in pleasure, more interested in pain, actually. <laughs> so, it's um, uh, 
to me, it's very subjective, right? But every time I, I go to my doctor, my doctor will say, oh, in the scale from zero to 10, how painful are you, right? Or how painful was it? Mm -hmm. In your experience, can you recall at a certain point in time, how painful was it? So people are always trying to find a way to measure pain. And uh, it is also a special studies in medical school. Um, so I, I am not quite sure what kind of pen you are talking about here. Is I, 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 I think I know what you're talking about, what kind of pleasure you're talking about. <laughs> it's a spectrum, right? <laughs> um, uh, and uh, 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 a prison probably does not always or necessarily inflict pen. It could cost some other things, you know. Solitude does not, or you know, less or not socialize with people. Or loneliness does not always mean painful. Um, so, uh, so that's it. That's it. It's very subjective, and I'm not quite sure exactly what kind of pain the prisoner will inflict. Definitely subjective. I mean, that's why I'm also. I'm, that's why queer theory can help us to untangle that because because. Uh, for God said that pleasure, pleasure is fluid. So something that is pleasurable for me is not pleasurable for you. So it's definitely subjective. And it's under, I mean, there are huge debates in the history of philosophy about pleasure. So I'm not solving that. <laughs> I'm just <laughs> trying to apply a little bit of that debate to prison because the debate it's come from, from, from ancient Greece and like the way that Aristotle and Plato defines pleasure. And there are still huge debates in the history of, of, of philosophy in relation to that. So yes, I'm, not, I'm, I'm suggesting a way to think about it, um, a way of thinking. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not saying that it's still subjective. I mean, I'm, I'm into to running, into triathlon. To do a marathon, it's, it's for some people, it's, it's pure suffering. And for others, just so pleasurable. So yes, it is subjective, definitely. And about the pain, that's subjective too. And, but also it's cultural, cultural also. Like I think Nietzsche is saying somewhere that the, like the limits of how pain we can, we can uh, um, <laughs> handle, it's kind of going down and, and down. So we can, we can handle less pain through the years. I don't remember now where he's saying that, but what I want to say is that you, when you are, when I was doing that kind of research with prisoners, I was really, it was really amazing the level of pain that these people have, have like experienced in their lives. I think you have that maybe too in your research. Like when you are doing research with people that they have so many, they, they, they have been, through, through, through many phases of pain, trauma, drama. It's like how they are alive. So yeah, pain is also subjective, definitely. That, that's why in, it's, in, in, it's a spectrum, because they are subjective. I have so many questions. <laughs> Thank you so much. This was really, really interesting and um, thought-provoking. Um, and I appreciate the non-pathologizing approach that you take, because a lot of psychological research on self-harm, self-destruction is immediately psychologizing. And, um, it, it, it renders these behaviors a function of a kind of inherent suicidality or, uh, you know, a, a tendency uh, 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 of the person. Um, uh, I mean, I'm not denying that this might be the case, but in so many situations, it's a lot can be traced to the material conditions and especially the prison is one such site where there's no doubt that the material conditions are not conducive to human flourishing. So I, I appreciate that. The questions I have uh, are several. I mean, one is, uh, you know, you were very specific in situating the site of your research in the south of Europe and the global south in Cyprus. And I wondered how this 
travels or translates or does it? I, I mean, this is not a fair question in the sense that that's not the side of your research, the, the, the non-self. But still, from your um, mastery of the scholarship and literature, do you find that the experience in the Global South prison is of a different caliber when it comes to pain and pleasure uh, than, say, the prisons in the Global North? And this is a huge generalization, yeah. obviously. But yeah. 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 Um, the, the other question I have um, is the relationship between self-harm and self-destruction. Mm -hmm. yeah. This is something that I find myself mm -hmm. grappling with a lot in my research, yeah. because one way to look at it, I think, is to see self-harm is a lesser form of self-destruction mm -hmm. uh, that may eventually slide into a full-blown uh, self-destruction. So partial self-destruction, let's say, vis-a-vis -vis total self-destruction. Yeah. Others I know tend to view self-harm as a kind of almost the opposite of self-destruction, something that prevents yeah. and precludes self-destruction um, because it's a kind of controlled enactment of agency that, or enactment that grants you a sense of agency that prevents you to sort of like slide away into, uh, uh, you know, the, the complete refusal of futurity, mm -hmm. let's yeah. say. Yeah. Um, so this is something I, I wonder what you what you think about that. And, um, <laughs> and, and finally, I think I'm really, um, interested in what you see the work that pleasure is doing mm. because like mm. it, it immediately makes me think of elaine scary's yeah very famous book yeah, the body yeah, in yeah. pain yeah. where for her the infliction of pain is the equivalent of the destruction of one's subjectivity pain is not vocalizable it's beyond language and when you, like she has a torture scene, when you inflict torture on the other person, you're doing it in order to destroy the person, uh, regardless of like the, like what you're doing, that's the, the end goal. Whereas, whereas one could also see pain or suffering as generative of a kind of indignation or, willpower or determination not to yield, to resist, to, to fight back, etc. So I mean we don't need to take her as the as the you know last word on the function of pain. Mm -hmm. But I think to flip it around, I'm curious like what does pleasure do? Is it something that neutralizes the subject um, that is otherwise in ready to be indignant? Uh, rebellious, or is it something that actually primes in a certain way the subject for more radical actions, such as like participating in resistance and um, uh, not bending to the will of, of uh, uh, the prison authority, it's a, I mean, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So, so obviously I'm taking like here, maybe the kind of pleasure that is not necessarily enmeshed in the dimension of sexuality, but more the resistance yeah. stuff that you are hinting at. Yeah. But um, yeah, so like, how do you how do you um, understand the function yeah. of pleasure to be? Yeah. Okay. Thank um, you. Yeah. Thank you so much, Mara. That's uh, so so. It's it's amazing. I mean, we can discuss. For hours about <laughs> things. Um, let me start from the first part of the question, which I think is easier. Um, I, I wrote a piece in isolation. I mean, in Cyprus during a PhD, uh, I didn't have a lot of chance to go out, travel, and present that argument where, while I was working on it. So I came to the realization that it, <laughs> It connected with the experience of people from the South later. <laughs> um, 
for example, when I'm, when I'm presenting that work in, uh, at Berkeley, the University of Berkeley, many people were like Latin American, they get the argument immediately. Like pleasure and resistance, like, like, it's like you are talking their language. Um, but, so I think that it's connected more. As, as in general, as, as a way to grasp more the, like, the, the core of the argument. Like, in relation to prisons now, um, I'm visiting San Quentin, which is really good. And in that way, I have the chance to talk with prisoners about, about those kind of things. Um, at the beginning, I was really, I was really like, I was feeling really, really scary to, to talk about pleasure in San Quentin. San Quentin is like, you know, all, all, uh, prison, prisons in the US are so overwhelming. The buildings, the entrance, the gates, the violence, it's, it's just different from, from, from prison in, in Cyprus. It's smaller, everything is just, it's different. Um, less strict, let's say. Um, however, in conversations that I have with prisoners, they, they, they manage to get that, the point of the argument. And, and in which ways? For example, in San Quentin, I'm visiting the education department of San Quentin. So I'm dealing with prisoners that they have a strong investment in education. That place, the college within in San Quentin. So the, the kind of the, that investment in education, it's, a, it's something pleasurable. It's also a kind of resistance that I couldn't, I was not able to grasp when I was writing that in Cyprus because mass incarceration in the US is, is a process of elimination. It eliminates people. So to be able to invest in learning and resist, it's, it's a process of resisting. You are staying alive through that process. So it's very com complicated. I'm still trying to get it, but I'm, I re I'm, I'm, I'm really lucky that I have that kind of conversations one-to-one -one with prisoners. <laughs> um, and I, I have like their thoughts on that and their experience of that. Uh, how um, in San Quentin, especially in the education department, learning is, is definitely related with the resistance, resistant to a system that wants to eliminate you. So that's, that's one of the things. And it's really, really complicated. I can't like generalize that. So that's why I'm very specific. I'm visiting San Quentin, the education department of San Quentin. I'm sure that if I was going to a maximum security prison, like the, the, the other um, the work of the mud and the which is like maximum security prisons, and it's like it's much it's harder to talk about those kind of things, uh, and it's like more related with resistance in other ways, in self-destructive ways. Now, going to the second part of the argument, what that work can do, why why is that can be useful? I think as as one, I will tell you what one of the prisoners said. Is the is dehumanizing to think that everything in prison is it's about pain. So for them and for me also, if you think about it, it's it offers them a kind of agency. Even if there is the agency that we don't like, <laughs> uh, is still a kind of agency, a kind of recognition that you have twenty five years there. Okay, food can be a pleasure. Pressurable exercise, drugs, um, peace. Um, so I, th I think it offers a more complicated understanding of the prison experience. This, this is what it's doing in a first level. Like when we're writing about those kind of things, like all the literature and criminology, it's about pain. Literally, all of it. Like it's, it's about pain. So for me, it's a way to like make that a little bit more complicated. It's, it's not, and it's not, doesn't change the pain. That's why a queer way of understanding that is useful. Doesn't pain change the pain that you feel, the, the experience that, that you have, the suffering, the violence. 
Now, if, if, I'm going, if I move a little bit to the self-harm and self-destruction and pain, that's, that's even more complicated now. I think we can understand resistance with pleasure. We can understand sexuality and pleasure. It's harder to grasp it. Self-destruction and pleasure. I'm using more the, the concept of the death drive in that, in that analysis um, because in a way, death drive um, offer us a, a way to understand that without pathologizing it and to go beyond the pain, like from, from the, like the way that, um, scar, 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 yeah, scary. scary, analyze it, which is, it's the pain, and it's, it's that, like you remain not neutral, but passive. Um, and I think that there are, there are more things that are, like we are not remaining. Sometimes we maybe remain <clears throat> passive, but there is a kind of uh, passive and active suffering, like I said. This is mostly from, from psychoanalysis, that idea of active suffering is, from, from Freud, the four that game, uh, like I'm trying to bring that into, into, into my analysis in order to, to make visible the passive ways of suffering and active ways of suffering. I know that it's really complicated to grasp that, but I mean, hunger strike, like your research, it's, it's, it's a more, it's a passive way of suffering. Active in other ways, but as, as a movement, like it's not like self harm. So it's a different way of self harm, but like showing your lips, it's, it's active. I mean, it's so active. So I, I really don't believe that in that kind of activation, there is no pain, there is no pleasure. Some, something motivates that, something activates that, that to go through that process. Um, now, in, in relation again to self harm and self destruction, yes, that, that, that's also very complicated. Um, and I think the most, one way to understand that is to take it in a spectrum. And yeah, for psychoanalysis, self harm, that is a kind of a eroticization of the, 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 the body and like the organ or like the, the part of the, the body that you are using. This is, this is like psychoanalysis is giving that explanation that there is a kind of investment and then eroticization. This is not the case for everyone. So we need, we need to activate a different kind of understandings, I think, and not to be holistic. Like this is true for everyone, it's so subjective. But yeah, I really think that psychoanalysis can offer us a way of, of dealing with that um, active suffering. Sorry, continue. Yeah. Thank you. I, yeah, Thank you. I, 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 can, I can say more things. <laughs> More a theoretical question yeah, yeah. about the, the binary pain and pleasure. I think one can say that uh, for the modern Western understanding, pleasure can be defined as the absence of a pain. Mm -hmm. And if I if I think of uh, Thomas Hobbes, he has a similar definition basically for him. Pleasure and the happiness is a, is an absence or avoidance of a pain. It's a, some interesting anthropological and political implication because there is not only the avoidance of a pain, but it's also the avoidance of a, the risk to be harmed and killed, and that goes into the to the political project of uh, this uh, gigantic device that we call the state that uh, is there in order to 
guarantee your safety. And then basically it also creates or so makes a subject, a state, makes a kind of a stable subject. And uh, who believe that in a certain way, they have to be satisfied with the fact that the pleasure is the absence of pain at the period. But I think, so this is one picture. And the second picture is uh, that uh, there is a kind of a, a different uh, way of understanding uh, the, the relationship between pain and pleasure. And, and Hobson knew about that. And, uh, and so if you want, it's the mystical tradition. So my question is, uh, what about pain and pleasure in, the, in mysticism, where uh, pain is, uh, is actually uh, the experience of the body that uh, opens up or can open up uh, a different kind of a pleasure. In that case, is the pleasure uh, for transcendence. So if I if I if I look at these two pictures, so on the one hand I have a I have a Hobbes and the, and the project of a making subjects and stable subjects. On the other hand, I have a mysticism that is much more unstable and basically plays with this uh, de and re subjectivation of, of, of different subjects. So uh, where, where, where I want to go is uh, that basically these two, uh, let's say, trajectories, traditions, uh, they always in, in the in the modern world they coexist and they and they were in, in, in a kind of a struggle with each other. Uh, the point is that to what extent in order to redefine uh, 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 this uh, this uh, this uh, relationship between pain and, and, and or let me put it in a very simple way so uh, what if we try to investigate histor historically mm -hmm. this relationship between pain and, mm -hmm. and, 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 and pleasure? And then, you know, basically, we, we can see that uh, these two terms form uh, an opposition only in a very narrow way of thinking that is uh, not even Western and modern is just a one single layer of what we call Western modernity, mm -hmm. because uh, even Western modernity was not able to completely erase and destroy all these other traditions, uh, which can be mystical, religious, yes. and, yes. and so on. Yes. That, you know, yes. in, in the south of Europe, yes. you have a, a lot of uh, uh, religious experiences yes, yes, yes. Uh, which imply suffering and pain. Uh, so in a certain way, the binary is always unstable. Mm -hmm. This is what I want to say. The binary is always unstable. And then it's only this kind of a narrow yeah. narrative yeah, yeah, yeah. that tries to make the, the binary stable because it's a political project. This is the way you produce the subject. I, I love that question. I mean, I love that analysis. Um, I will start from the last point. It's very narrow, but it's very dominant in certain fields. So it's very narrow, I agree. I agree with all that analysis, but I think it's dominant in criminology, definitely. I mean, as an idea, the idea of sites about the pains of infringement is still there. We, like, we can revise the text, blah, 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 but it's still there. It's very, very dominant. Um, that's one thing. The other thing is psychology is also dominant. Um, so I will say that in certain areas, there is more flexibility, let's say, more fluidity. And then we have certain areas that the, the, that binary is more strong or, or, or more, more like uh, dominant or present. Uh, but I totally agree with you. And I think it's, that's why I said, I said that I, it's coming from Plato and Aristotle in a way, but it's like a way that psychoanalysis is taken more from Plato. Um, that idea of the absence of pain of hopes 
is a more Aristotelian one, I will say. I, I don't have exactly in mind, but I will say from, from the absence of pain, it's more Aristotelian. Like Aristotle is like the achievement of the good uh, pleasure. So pleasure is the achievement of, of, of a good state. Um, and yet bo both of, the, of, those, of those ideas that are connected with the, the state in many ways, but also with the ways that we, we are becoming subjects, uh, as you said, like in relation to the state, but also in relation to ourselves. Um, and pleasure is so, it's so important the last years outside of prisons. Like it's becoming as an idea so important in, I will say that in Western tradition it's becoming even more it's like, what is pleasurable? What did you ate? What you did? It's like so important, so much talking about, about that pleasure. And then the avoid of suffering also in, in the Western, not South traditions. So I think, and yeah, also like religion, mysticism, it's like <laughs> so much pain there, so much suffering. Uh, I, I grew up in a very like conservative Orthodox environment. And there is so much suffering, fasting. Um, and then after the, the suffering, the pleasure comes. Mm -hmm. So in a way in South, in certain countries and in religion, in relation to religion and mysticism and those kind of things, there is a, a connection there. Things are more, are, are less strict, are, are more loose. Um, but I think that in certain disciplines, this is definitely a binary. Yeah. Thank you so much. Any other questions? Of course. Thank you so much for the talk. I have many questions, but I'll just try to lay out a few. Um, in some ways, there, there, there are questions about the methodology of the mm -hmm. project. Um, and one way, one entry point is a phrase that you used a couple of times towards the end, which was the prison experience. Mm -hmm. so I have a question in a sense about the prison part of that and then about the experience. The experience. Part of it. So the first is, a, is what exactly does the prison do to the project as a whole? Is it that the prison is an exceptional space where the relationship between pleasure and pain is different than under ordinary conditions? Mm -hmm. Or is it that the prison brings to light something which is always already the case external to the prison? It's a condensation or intensification of something that is always already yeah. there. So that's yeah. the kind of first question. The second had to do with the methodological move to interviewing people about their mm -hmm. experiences. Mm -hmm. And it's because of uh, kind of building a little bit off of what Bani was saying that a lot of the work in, so Elaine Scary is not the only person to think that pain has a kind of subject destroying effect, mm -hmm. or at least maybe put less dramatically kind of uh, alters the conditions for experience such that it becomes hard to articulate, especially after the fact, the experience mm -hmm. of pain. I'm thinking more of the, the queer theory tradition mm -hmm. that I through the code that talks about pleasure and pain in terms of limited experiences, as in the, the stretching of the experience, so much so that it becomes difficult to reformulate that, or capture that in, in the kind of direct discourse after the fact, and that that's what's interesting about both pleasure and pain, and that's where pleasure and pain meet, that they're not opposites, but that they're the two faces of this process of pushing oneself to a limit. But that produces methodological problems, right, to try to study that because you can't just ask someone what that's like because you're trying to capture the very idea of something that is undermines the capacity to render it into discourse. So the first question is like, is the prison an exceptional space or, or not? Yeah. The second is, what's this limited experience? And then the last question was uh, is about, um, why sometimes it sounded like you were talking about pleasure and sometimes it sounded like you were talking about desire mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it, when 
But Foucault, for example, talks about pleasure. I take it partially to be a criticism of the psychoanalytic focus on desire. He's precisely not talking about desire yeah, yeah. because of the suspicion that there is a parallel in psychoanalytic fixation on desire with a kind of Christian focus on motivation. And what is the seat of this? You use the phrase, what activates it? Why does somebody want to do this thing? Mm -hmm. And I think Foucault partially by using the language of bodies and pleasure, rather than the psychoanalytic language yeah. of desire and wants and drives, was trying to get at the idea of suspending the desire to interrogate the source of that in something interior to the person rather than the exterior, the almost physiological experience of pleasure as distinct from its psychoanalytic source. And so I was curious about the slippage in the, between pleasure and desire in, in what you're talking about. Thank you very much. That was uh, that's a great question. Uh, I want to start from the last part, pleasure and desire. So when I was reading, uh, when I was writing that part, um, that that work two, three years ago, um, I was I had two different documents. One was working with pleasure and one with desire. So and I was trying to see with which one I will go. So it's interesting that you like pick up that because it's like. While I went, I went with desire, uh, with pleasure. It's like desire is coming, and is so. Foucault was definitely clear that he wanted to opposite that idea of desire because he didn't want to uh, like connect the subject with that that an, a psychoanalytic explanation of the self. Um, and that was a kind of a disagreement with with um, the lesson what I read too. So yeah, for me. I try. I'm, 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 I. I don't know why. Like desire is coming as 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 a concept in there. I'm trying to go with pleasure, but I think the two things that are also in some some cases connected in ways that is hard to explain. Um, but I definitely understand that that there is that kind of slippage maybe to, to desire. While I want to talk about pleasure, I don't want to talk talk about desire. I think. It's it's aestheticizing maybe the place also romanticizing the concept of desire, uh, while pleasure gives me the opportunity to talk about resistance also more. Uh, pleasure gives also the creates that contrast with pain, so pleasure works more in that argument. But yeah, I I get what you, what you are what you are talking about. There is a kind of desire to resist this i was using that desire to resist desire to do that so i want to give give like um space to that activation and i think in some in some ways that activation is related with desire like that agency sometimes is related with desire and the and pleasure is the outcome so it's very compl complicated philosophically, um, and I, I'm really, I'm really, I'm not able to distinguish exactly. But I, I think what I'm, I'm just now saying, it's more important. Like there is a desire to do something, and then the, the pleasure is the outcome, and the process can be really painful. That's also important. So that's why I didn't want that idea of desire from the beginning. There is that kind of. Um, like for Foucault, uh, pleasure is something that can be completely empty. We are just putting meaning of that idea of pleasure. It's not, and desire have a kind of depth. And I don't want to have that kind of depth. I want to keep that, that, that fluidity. Um, I hope that this answers a little bit. Uh, the question is, it's like really, really complicated to, to understand the nuances of it. Um, now, in relation to prison as an exceptional place or prison as the place in which some things are more visible, uh, I think, I don't know if both things can coexist, but I really think that both things are, are true for the, for the case of prison. It's like by working there, I have that feeling that definitely prisons, detention camps, 
like all these places are places of suffering and like this the way that the state is punitive it's it creates that exceptional space definitely the same time i feel that when we, you are dealing with the experience of people who are like trying to um, <laughs> to give a different meaning to that but the, the one does not exclude the other in a way or or in my work i'm trying not to to make the opposite uh, it's not an agamben project in that sense that is all oh, that ex that um, exceptional place. It is exceptional and it is not in some ways. It's, it's so complicated. The punitiveness is exceptional. I mean, for, for example, in the US, you, you have that like so punitive system, but I am here like for six months. I feel that the system is punitive anyway outside of prison as well. So there is a kind of continuity. Um, and what was the other question about the prison experience? About the limited experience. Yeah, Just yeah. Reliance on experience yeah. as if it's uh, empirical. Yeah, form. yeah. That's 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 a good question because if someone was growing like from phenomenological accounts, it would be like more easily to maybe for someone to focus on the experience of the meaning of the experience and things like that. I, do, I want to focus more on the circumstances in which their experience are taking place. So I'm trying to bring them together and not to go into that, in my view, phenomenological analysis, which is what that experience means for you. Like not that kind of thing, but like the circumstances, the structure, the situation. The situation is always important. So I'm trying to, like taking that into consideration when, when I'm write, writing about pleasure. And that's why pleasure is different here in San Quentin and it's different in Cyprus. So the, the prison experience is totally different. Um, the way that prisoners resist is, is different. Um, so, and the way that I did that research, I was not asking them about pleasure. I was just uh, asking them like to narrate me my, their experience. In prison, so we had like conversations about that experience. So it was not, you know, I didn't go there and say, okay, my research is about pleasure and talk me about pleasure. pleasure. Like pleasure came as an outcome of the of the narratives. I was really trying to make sense of some things, some paradoxes, memories. Like I said, falling in love, that tendency for self-destruction, for self-harm, like also like prisoners tattoo, it's a whole thing. Um, tattooing, piercing. Um, so yeah, experience, but not, not in a phenomenological way. Like in a way that they can like lead us to understand things about the context also. So I'm trying to go back and forth. To, from their experience to the context, from the context to their experience and, and to see how they want to inform the other. Um, thank you so much for the incredible talk. Um, the question that I want to raise is sort of on the topic of privacy and whether or not that has sort of like been, um, because um, in hearing this talk, I feel like there is an underlying paradox of privacy um, in prison as a place in which one is stripped of it, often searched and violated, but often, you know, among the other three paradoxes that you speak through, pain, resistance, and sexuality, there, um, there is something about, I was hearing in talks about some harm or piercing that there is like a, you know, a, a site of like, perhaps not the bridge, but autonomy and sort of being to witness like that very intimate pain that is something that's, you know, embodied and is not able to be, you know, experienced by, you know, by the carceral system that surrounds them, uh, as well as the uh, prisoner whose experience you talked about, like um, imagining himself as a king as a way of sort of like um, survive, like getting through the process. He said um, it's the only way he could survive it. And on the other hand, um, when you're discussing Julia, in which case there is sort of like this, um, a more like performative or like you know a degree in which you know 
privacy is being invaded, but it is also a site of, um, of pleasure in being witnessed. And I'm just, I'm just very curious about like where, um, where you think the role of privacy is sort of playing in all of these experiences. Yeah, thank you, thank you. That's so, so, so good and important. Um, now, I, I think privacy is one of the main things in prison in general. It's one of the things, it's one of the pains of imprisonment. The fact that the people that are losing their, their privacy, their, their integrity. So, and then prisoners, they are playing with them. This is what I'm trying to, to show. I'm trying to, 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 to show that, yes, you are losing your privacy. And it's part of the structural, um, um, it's, 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 it's a structural thing to lose your privacy in prisons. And then you have all these searches and strips out and things like that. So, so you are losing your integrity. And then you are playing with that. Now, some prison, for some prisoners, it's more easy to play and for some others, it's harder. So th there is the, is the experience. Like some of them, they want to play with that. I mean, I had like narrations in which like the, the people was telling me that in the strips, I just taking out my clothes and it's, it's fun. And then you're like, this is fun. Like for some people it's so dramatic. So I'm again trying to open the complexity of that. But definitely the, the, the lost, the, the fact that people that are losing their privacy, it's one of, of the pains of, of imprisonment. So again, it's one of the things that some of them, they may play a little bit. Some of them, they can feel it de de definitely like traumatic. Uh, some of them, they can be more submissive. Oh, yeah. Okay. What? What is the problem with that? I mean, you have different kind of, re of reactions and I'm just trying to make sense to that reaction. And that can be also related with the like masculinity and femininity in prisons. You have different reactions in relation to strip searches from women and men, um, from people that they feel confidence in their body and people that they don't. But it's many, it's many things that they can inform your reaction to, to, to some things, something like that. Cheers, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, do we have any questions from our Zoom participants? So please, um, I don't, yeah. Let me check. The Wi-Fi is unstable. No, no, yeah, no, we don't have any questions. Okay. Okay. Yeah, we lost some people maybe because the Wi-Fi was unstable. I there was a lot earlier. But thank you so much. Uh, please join me in thanking Elena. Thank you. Thank you so thank you. much. So what happened? Uh, to, oh, really? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah.